I'll uh, welcome everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Natalie Fritz, and I am the um, Archivist and Director of Collections Outreach and Social Media. And um, usually I do these virtual programs. Um, I've been doing them the last two years, but I don't have to do them tonight. Uh, we've got some special guests uh, from our staff uh, that are going to be sharing some stories with you tonight. Uh, about their own personal experiences with archaeology and just some general background on archaeology and um, maybe some of the things in our collection as well. Uh, so I will be turning it over to them. Um, but we've got uh, Gabrielle Doty with us, uh, who is a uh, summer intern. Uh, she actually started with us earlier this year as a community service student um, doing part of the uh, Wittenberg community service requirements. So she worked up in the library and archives and then she applied for the summer internship. And she has been working with us doing uh, a lot with our social media and outreach. And uh, she'll be wrapping up at the end of this week uh, with our Summer Sky Family Festival that will have wonderful weather and uh, turnout and everything. Uh, so we'll, we'll be very optimistic about that because we've got a lot of fun stuff planned for that. Um, and that'll be a um, big, nice, big, fun thing to wrap up uh, her internship this summer. Um, but she'll be sharing some, uh, she'll tell you a little bit more what she's sharing, a, a special experience that she did this summer. And then our um, Registrar um, Ray White is going to be sharing uh, with you as well. So um, I will just go ahead and turn it over to um, uh, Rachel first, who's going to uh, share her screen and let you know what she's going to be talking about and introduce herself a little more. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so um, as Natalie said, my name is Ray. I am the registrar at. Uh, the Clark County Historical Society. Uh, um, and I have the, a background in museums. However, I, my degrees are in archeology. span uh, So a lot of my schooling was in archeology span and a lot of my first jobs were in archeology span collections specifically. Um, so for the first half, I'm going to talk about archeology. span um, What is it and why it's important? Um, I'm going to... So archaeology is the study of the human past um, using material remains. These remains can be any object that people may have created, modified, or used. Uh, the prefix or, uh, of archaeology, so archae means old or ancient, and then the suffix ology means the study of. Um, the traditional human aspect of archaeology actually comes from the term anthropology, which archaeology is a subfield of. Um, it's all the prefix anthro is what means human, um, so the study of humans. Um, and then archaeology is just one of four fields of anthropology, so you also have cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, and linguistic an anthropology. Um, and then in order to understand the past, uh, archaeologists will frequently excavate areas where they believe cultural uh, remnants may be. They determine these areas that um, they'll be excavating typically in a few different ways. The most common way is just by walking a field, throwing down flags where they either find, say, old ceramics that are coming up, pieces of bricks, arrowheads, uh, things like that. Um, another way is that they are hired um, by companies. Say Walmart wants to come into your town and build a new super center. Before the Walmart can build that, they have to contract out a cultural resource management firm uh, and have archaeologists make sure there's no nothing culturally significant on the land that they want to develop. That goes for anything you want to build and if you want to put an ATM in. So even if there's already a building there, if you'd like to install an ATM, you have to have an archaeologist come out first. Um, if an archaeologist determines that the land uh, that you're on is culturally relevant, they usually have to excavate. Um, excavating essentially is digging, but with a lot of procedures and precision. Um, you're carefully removing earth systematically to uncover remains, artifacts, and um, features. Archaeologists are often looking for two things when they're excavating. They're looking for artifacts and features. Uh, artifacts are what you're going to see most at museums, like in ours. Um, it's typically things as described as things you can pick up and move, take with you. So like I said, ceramics, bricks, nails, toys, 
things of that nature, where features are going to be things that indicate to you that life was once there. Um, so it's not something that's typically portable. For example, it might be a change in soil color. Um, so in this picture, you can see there's a big, a really big dark circle in the middle of the unit. Um, that soil stain could indicate anything from a post hole that used to be there from a bridge, a building, or a fence. Um, it could also indicate that someone at one point dug a hole there and then um, refilled the hole with different dirt from a later period. Um, so archeologists often have to um, excavate and then make sense of everything that they have found. Um, and it's not always because the civilizations they're studying didn't have written language, but often that is why. Um, it's not that they didn't have written language or it's that sometimes they just don't have any historic texts from them. That can also include places that we still have their historic texts. However, we haven't deciphered what the language means. Um, so that often will require linguistic archeology uh, anthropology, but essentially you're used to seeing archaeologists dig in holes and sift through dirt and do things like this. However, archaeologists also spend a lot of time in the lab sorting through um, artifacts, making 3D models, um, and chemically analyzing ceramics. What archaeologists don't do is this. I unfortunately cannot answer any of your dinosaur questions. I know nothing about them. Their bones are radioactive. That's about as far as I will get. <laughs> um, there often archaeologists come across a lot of amateur archaeologists. You'll often find museums um, having people offer them donations saying, oh, I used to dig out in my grandparents' backyard and I have all these arrow points. Um, so an amateur archaeologist is someone who usually does archaeological work as a hobby, but not a profession. Um, they're untrained and they're uninformed when it comes to laws, required permits, and techniques that archaeologists will use. Um, these techniques include, basically make the field of archaeology today uniform. Um, so no matter where you go, theoretically in the country, in the world, archaeology Archaeology, for the most part, is almost always done the same, creating one by one meter units and slowly removing the dirt back. Um, so when people excavate without the proper procedures and techniques, aka the big, really, they dig really big holes, uh, they will take little to no provenience of where they're getting the artifacts. Um, they'll miss important clues such as features, changes in the soil colors and characteristics. Um, I know are one of our very old curators here at Clark County, uh, is often referred to as an amateur archeologist. His name was Arthur Ultick. And when I'm referring to changes in soil color, you can see in this picture, their soil goes from very dark to very light. And you can kind of see where those lines would come across. Um, so as I was talking about before, archeologists are going to slowly pull the dirt back. They're not going to use a shovel. They're going to use a trowel. So you can see um, John is, my friend, is slowly pulling the dirt back uh, little by little. We are noting any changes in soil that we're finding as the, um, any changes in the texture of the soil. And we're looking for just really, really small artifacts that might otherwise be missed. Um, when we are taking the dirt back like that, you'll see buckets behind him. He, we put the dirt into the buckets dump it into screens like these with very small holes um, and then rub the dirt through. So that way any artifacts that are in there are much easier to find. Um, and then again, I mentioned earlier the importance of provenience. So noting every time there is a color change in soil or texture, um, every time there is a color change in that soil, we call that a layer, um, that way we can more easily note how deep we are. Uh, sometimes it'll tell us how far back in say like the timeline that we are, if we have a really good understanding of the history of the area. Um, it'll also help us relate artifacts from one unit to a different unit. Say um, two people are digging in a unit 
uh, on one end of the field site and say maybe half a mile away, someone's digging in another unit. Um, if the artifacts are from the same level of dirt, the color was the same, they were both in level A or level B, we'd be able to note that these artifacts are probably from the same period. Um, and then here's again, just a better picture of the soil changes that you'll often come across. So this is the north wall in a unit that I was digging um, back in 2021. You can see the top layer is very dark dirt um, and it was on the beach. So you can see there's kind of sand up top. It goes straight to dirt. Um, and then down below it goes back to sand as things decompose. That's why you're seeing those soil changes. If say you were excavating on a place that used to be a farm or a plantation, a lot of times those first few layers are really mixed up and it makes it a lot harder for us. Um, so if you, again, the soil features, a lot of times those will tell us where um, structures used to be. Uh, here in the state of Ohio, I, I used to work at Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. Um, and on those mounds and the mounds uh, at Cahokia, we know that there are, oh my goodness, we know that there are buildings that were once in and around all of those mounds. And we know that the buildings were there not because they still stood when we found them, but because um, of the post holes that were left behind. So the as the wood decomposed, it changed the color in the soil around it. Um, and we were able to tell that there were post holes there and how far apart they were told us about how big the structures were. Um, so archeology span and museums. It's important to note that archeology span actually goes back thousands of years. Um, I think the earliest note is in 600 BCE, um, but archeology span as we know it today really goes back just a couple hundred years. Um, a lot of, Early collecting in archaeology um, and other cultural materials was heavily driven by the idea of status, especially as they um, discovered the New World and even with the Silk Road, uh, with the trading. Cabinets of curiosities, exotic artifacts, things like that all help show someone's wealth and help secure their status um, in society. It was more like a visual secure than actually proving that they had the money. Um, many of these um, collectors, I should say, hi would hire archeologists. Um, they would, weren't doing the work themselves. So once they got the artifacts, there was very little care for what the artifact actually was, as long as it was interesting looking. Uh, they didn't care if it really told a cool story. They just wanted people to be impressed with what they had. Um, these collections were often later than donated to institutions such as the British Museum or the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, I know here at Clark County, we also have a few things um, similar to that from when we first opened. Uh, one really famous story is the Elgin Marbles. Many of you will recognize these. They're in the British Museum. They are from the Parthenon. Uh, Greece has asked for them back on several different occasions. The British Museum refused to. They were collected by the Earl of Elgin. Um, he claims that he paid for them, to which he then sold them to the British government. The British government says they rightfully own them. Greece says they do not. I think Great Britain should give them back. Uh, in that same sense, Great Britain also has pipes from Mound City that were excavated. Um, uh, we ha I don't think we have any pipes at Clark County, at least I haven't seen them, but uh, they technically have agreed to move them to a loan status. So eventually they're theoretically coming back to the United States. However, they, have, they, they own them. Um, so in our collection, we do have, have lots of Hopewellian and Adena artifacts. Um, this is one of the artifacts in our collection is an obsidian blade or a spear point, a spear. Um, obsidian is a glass-like structure that is made from um, volcanoes when they erupt and then the lava hardens. The glass is really strong 
and it can be really sharp and really thin, which makes it a really good object for flint napping and creating weapons out of. Um, this specific one would have come from somewhere like California or Yellow, where Yellowstone National Park is. So we're talking anywhere from uh, 1,500 to 2,500 2, miles away. Um, these people would have been walking on foot for the most part, they uh, traveling by boat where they could. However, Hopewellian culture is often thought to be a religion versus a culture. Um, so they would have been traveling to Ohio to bury their loved ones, bury important people in their society. Um, and that's why we have these artifacts that are coming from so far away. Uh, there are also often shells found from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and while some people did live in the area, it's mostly thought that people were traveling to the area maybe once, twice a year, kind of like um, a trek similar to a lot of Christians and um, other people make treks to religious sites. These places are thought of more like churches and cemeteries for us. Um, this specifically came from Manring Mound, which is um, in Clark County. It was excavated by Arthur Ultick uh, in the early 1900s, and it was um, done. So they had to excavate it because it, the National Road went right through it. Um, so Arthur Ultick felt that it was really important that they get out there before they built the National Road and make sure that they got everything that they could and documented it to the best at the time that, that he knew how. Um, and then again, here's just a picture showing where um, that obsidian would have come from and where we are now. And if you look at the bottom Gulf of Mexico, kind of where it says Tallahassee, um, all along that border is where a lot of large shells would have come from as well. We also have bear teeth that they worked um, into necklaces and other pieces of jewelry. Um, they would have been working bones into different kinds of tools. We have breastplates. Um, they're not entirely sure what breastplates would have been used for. They just often find them buried. When people are buried, they find them directly on their breasts. So that is what they call them. Uh, and lots of celts were found at Manring Mound as well. Um, that's all I have. So. Well, I want to uh, take any questions from people, but I have a couple of questions um, for you. Um, this is something I remember hearing before about uh, dinosaur bones being radioactive. What makes them radioactive? They're really, they're just, that's, they're that old. Uh, they've been in the ground for that long. I really couldn't tell you. When I worked at the Cincinnati Museum Center, we just went through training uh, and we're told, you know, you know, it's fun to lick the bones. You see people lick the bones. Stop licking the bones. <laughs> so. Um, so I, I, and I have another, I, I know we've had some discussions in our, amongst staff uh, uh, about, you know, Ultic, the collection he has, why we have the things that we have, uh, because he was kind of like the guy that people went to if they found mm -hmm. something on their farm or if they discovered something um, anywhere throughout Ohio. So we, that's why we have a lot of stuff that's not necessarily from our area. And um, the reason we ended up with the cases that we currently have on the second floor the way that they are was because um, I know Casey, um, you know, she had a lot of experience with this, that it was a temporary exhibit that we would bring out every fall for the, um, as part of, you know, school group tours that were coming in at that time, we would bring out those local um, items that were found and put them on display just for the month of October or around then. Um, and at one point we had said, you know, we should um, make a permanent, more permanent exhibit so we can put out those, those things that are, uh, that are local. Um, and it's raised some que and, and, and I, questions as to like looking back at Altic and his methods. So my question would be that we might need to do a little bit of research is we, we always refer to him as an amateur archaeologist, but how did his methods at the time line up to 
other methods at the time because we know he was published in some things so i would like to you know it would be interesting to to find we know like this article was public about him excavating like the campbell mounds or the man ring mounds was published in this particular journal it would be interesting for us to look at the rest of those journals from that same time period to see like how his methods compared um, cause I know that Rachel, you asked specifically like how we could find more about the provenance of the stuff that we have. And his articles are not that specific because he wasn't using those same methods. Like this came from this unit of like excavated space. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that detail level of detail to be able to like show exactly where things come from. So I'm just curious how that compares to you know, the 1930s, 1940s time period when he was working, if that's, uh, if that's uh, normal for, for it to be like that. So I would, you know, moving forward with any changes we make, I think it would be interesting to like put him more into perspective of I, his methods. I, I can tell you that for the most part, um, when I was in school, people often referred to Thomas Jefferson as the father of American archaeology. He, while things are different, he's the one that kind of came up with the idea that, okay, it should be a, a square unit. It should be slowly pulled back um, over time. We should like rush and just dig holes where we think things are going to be interesting. So as far as like the early 1930s, for the most part, the, other trained archaeologists, which were very far and few between, um, would have been doing it very similarly to the way that I just described. Uh, I have, uh, there's a question from Patty here for you, um, was what was the most interesting thing um, that you uncovered in an archaeological dig you were working on? Um, so I kind of have two. When I worked at Hopewell, I didn't uncover it, but I got to write and make a video on a mushroom wand. Um, it looks just like a wand you would expect to find a wizard. I would say it was about yay long and it had a mushroom at the top of it. Um, that was really interesting to get to see. It was made of copper um, and to think about how someone would have crafted that. But the most interesting thing I ever found, I used to live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, the, there was a plantation there that is now called Brook Green Gardens. Um, they had the largest slave population in the country, but they don't know where the slave village was. The house burnt down, um, the village was destroyed and all that's left are some, cemetery, are some graves. So uh, I helped with a few very small group of other people. That's actually what these photos are. Oh, hang on. Um, we were searching for the slave village and in this unit in particular, we found um, several pieces of porcelain that had been painted black, um, bricks and um, several old post holes that would have indicated houses would have been there. Uh, does anybody have any other questions uh, right now? We'll we'll go we'll we'll probably get back to some more um, discussion and questions in, in a little bit. But um, thank you, uh, Ray, for sharing with us. Uh, and I will um, go over to Gabrielle so she can uh, introduce herself more fully and tell us a little bit about uh, her adventures this. Summer just a, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so hello, my name is Gabrielle Doty. I'm currently interning at the Heritage Center um, and I'm an undergraduate student at Wittenberg. I'm studying, or I'm majoring in history and sociology with a focus in anthropology, um, and I'm minoring in archaeology and pre modern atrium worlds. So to complete my minor, um, I went over to Ireland for two weeks to do a field school with the Irish Archaeology Field School, a very on the nose name. Um, so first, I'm going to give you some background over what the school was doing, what project I was working on to kind of paint the picture of everything. So um, this 
program I was working on was Caring, Digging the Lost Town. So we were tasked um, in partnership with the school and a local um, heritage open air museum that owns the land currently um, to uncover the first Anglo-Norman settlement in Ireland. So essentially what that means is the first settlement of English knights um, in the whole country of Ireland is at the specific location and it's pretty much unknown to the public. Um, we have a little bit of runes and a monument that stands there completely unrelated to the town, but otherwise you can drive right past it and not know that it exists. So the field school approached the Heritage Museum a couple years ago and was like, hey, we'd like to bring students here to teach them how to do archaeology. And they said, great, we have a location that we want you to work on. Um, so for most of the students, they were tasked with um, uncovering where the castle used to be, um, which was later torn down, and a church and a dining hall were built in its place, and eventually those bricks were used to form this monument that currently stands. So they brought in a bunch of kids, they were able to do, I think, four cuttings, and they found all the evidence and the foundations of the three structures they were looking for. This was huge, they proved that this was the location um, that they thought. So. Uh, when I signed up, I really wasn't really sure exactly what I was going to be doing on um, the history of anything. So the first day there, they sat us down, they gave us the full rundown of all the history we needed to know and said, um, we have a contract with a farmer just across the way. The field that he owns, we think that's where the village stood um, originally, and he's given us a year to come in and find it. Um, so they are super excited. They've been wanting to find this village for years and years and years, and we finally um, were able to. So here are some nice uh, pretty shots of what the town used to look like. It's at a very prominent location as far as training goes, um, so it makes sense that this would be the first place that the English would settle if they want to have a little bit of control. Um, so this is a nice overhead map. So with my cursor um, at the bottom corner, this is the map of Ireland and that dot is Wexford. That is the larger town um, that this is from. So following my cursor all along this top coast, that is the Heritage Park. And then this tip area right here, that's where they believe that um, the village was the entire settlement. Um, so that circle at the top, that's where the castle is located and that's where the monument currently stands. So we knew that previously. Um, but we were tasked, as I said, to find the village. And yeah, so here's another overhead shot. Um, as you can see in the center, that's that stone spire that they made as a monument. And there's a couple cuttings here and here and here and here. Um, they had some amateur archaeologists come in years ago. Um, they had to get shut down. And then when the school became in partnership with the museum, they were able to reopen those um, and do more formal work on them. So in this bottom corner, that is the field that we were granted permission um, to work in. So as you can see, there's a highway that cuts right down in the center of everything. So that highway was built, I wanna say 1970s, 1980s, before they had any protection acts in place that told them, hey, you can't build roads through like really important historical sites. So unfortunately that road took up most of what was left in the ground. Um, but this top kind of area here is right at the edge of where the border would be. Um, and the top, we have a map from, I want to say, 18th century that shows kind of the line of where the town village was. Um, and another way that they were able to prove that, hey, we think this is where um, the remnants of the village is, is they use geophysics, which is essentially um, a big kind of device that they physically walk across the land and it scans about a meter into the ground and it will pick up when there's um, admiralities in the soil that might have been walls or ditches or something that isn't supposed to be there naturally. Um, so at the bottom corner, you can see some of the geophysics that they pulled showing that, hey, there's definitely some stuff here. So um, that's a little background on the site. Um, some other things that we knew going into it is that not only was this the location we think of the medieval village, um, there was a settlement there, more modern periods to so like 18th, 19th century. So we might run into some stuff from that. There was also a Neolithic settlement there, which is Stone Age. We're just starting to build our first settlements, agriculture, that sort of thing. So there was a good chance that we were going to run into some pretty early stuff and some pretty late stuff. And we were hoping to find what was dead center in the middle. Um, so we did two cuttings. First of which was at the corner of the property. That's where they believe there to be a town ditch. Um, a lot of these medieval settlements, what they did is they would have a just essentially a trench that went all the way around 
it acted a little bit as protection, but also a way to formally say, hey, this is the end of our settlement. So we were hoping that um, over the years, obviously that would fill up a bit, but if we dug down far enough, we could see where the soil changes and identify, hey, there was a ditch here. Um, and that's really good evidence that they use a lot of time to prove that a village did in fact exist. So the first um, area that we focused on is where we thought that ditch was. Um, so if you follow my cursor, this whole area when we first showed up was completely thick of forest. So the first day they were like, you need to tear all this back. Um, so we spent a full day just tearing apart the forest um, and we came across a wall and we got really, really excited because ditches were used to mark town borders, but walls were also used. Um, so when we came across this wall, we were like, oh, this is amazing, this is great. Um, we were hoping that it might be medieval, but we weren't getting our hopes up. After um, removing some of the stones, we found some pottery that was lodged in between and we dated it to 18th century. So it was a modern wall, unfortunately, but we got really excited nonetheless. Um, but directly behind this wall, you can't really see it in this picture, but it was uh, back here. There was two indentations in the ground that you could see just by looking at it. that were very clearly like something was there, most likely a ditch. So once we identified um, the wall and the potential ditches, we essentially made a rectangle that went through all of them. I don't think I included a photo of that, but then from there, we just slowly started to dig down. So in my two weeks um, at Ireland, I did a program that's fully focused on excavation. So they taught us everything we needed to know from start to finish of how to excavate land. Um, so that way it gave us the formal training that if we wanna continue in archeology, span we kind of have that base layer ready to go. Um, so the first thing that we learned is how to survey the land, which is essentially what I just explained to you. Um, you look, you see, we identified, we know through geophysics that this area and this area have some stuff. Um, and once we cleared back the forest and we saw the wall, we were like, this is exactly where we need to do. So the next um, thing that we learned is planning. Um, so essentially you just draw out what's present. So that way, once you start excavating, you can look back on your drawings, see where you started, see where you're at now. Um, so I got tasked with drawing this wall. Um, unfortunately, that meant I had to draw everything exactly to scale. Um, and there were hundreds and hundreds of rocks in this wall and it took me about two days to complete and I wasn't able to finish it. Somebody took over from me because I got moved to a different location. Um, but essentially we put a string up and measuring tape and we had a rebar and we mapped out every single stone and we drew it all to scale. Um, so that way they can look back at these drawings Based on the way the stones are placed, the way they uh, potentially moved, it helps us date it better. Um, so the next thing that I got to do was the actual excavation, which is what you really know archaeology for. So this is the second cutting. Um, as you can see, it's pretty much just a long rectangle, but it went over where we think three of the features were. One of them was a potential wall. One of them was a ring ditch, and I'm not sure what the other one was, but essentially, um, our instructors, uh, we gridded everything out into like meter, square meter by square meters. And they would tell us, hey, this part you're going to go down, this part you're going to keep up. And we just slowly worked our way down across the two weeks. Um, so as um, Rachel kind of explained already, uh, we use a lot of troweling whenever we come across really sensitive archaeology. So potential walls, any ditches, exposed pottery, soil admiralities we'd be really careful to go through. Um, but to get rid of that first base layer of soil, we were given permission to use shovels and to use Maddox to help get through a little bit faster because um, we were on a little bit of a time crunch and depending on how sensitive the area is, you are either allowed or not allowed. And also being in Ireland, the rules are a little bit different than in America. Um, so yeah, <coughs> apologies. Um, so the last thing I got to do while I was there, which is the most exciting visually, is I got to do post-excavation. Um, oh, there's a photo of me with the mattock when we got to do a little bit of topsoil digging. Um, so in post-excavation, one day a week, um, you were pulled off <coughs> and you got to go through and clean all the artifacts that were found in the previous day. Um, so we had trays from each of the two cuttings, anything that was pottery, bone, um, pretty much anything but metal, you took toothbrushes and a little bit of water and you cleaned, clean, cleaned until you could see the nice full piece. Um, something really interesting that we learned is that any pottery that was made in Ireland, the clay is going to be orange. Any that was made in England, it was gray. And anything made in France is white. So just by cleaning it, you can immediately identify where it was from. 
based on the glaze type that also help us date it. But mainly we just tried to get as much soil away as possible so that way we could label it. As you can see in the center tray, <coughs> we have some pottery. Um, right here is a little like, I think it was stone pipes. You know you're in Ireland if you're digging up stone pipes. They were absolutely everywhere. Um, we have some pieces of flint and we even found a golf ball, which is very exciting. Not what they were looking for, but they were they, that one gave um, our instructors a nice big kick. And then over on the side, um, this was from the cutting by the wall. We found a couple roof tiles that were glazed, um, as well as a brick and a donkey horseshoe. All of this we dated to like the um, modern period, 18th century. So while it was super nice, not exactly what we were looking for. And then on my last slide here, <coughs> are two of the finds that I was able to uncover. The one on the left, really exciting. This is a piece of um, medieval pottery, exactly what we were hoping to find. I was able to find the first piece of that week and I got my instructors really hopeful because up until that point, we thought we found a wall, but it was just a rock deposit and we had started to uncover a ditch, but it was dated to the Neolithic period. So just a little bit too late. Um, but this was dead on for what we were looking for in the first step of uncovering what they were hoping to get at. And then this other piece um, was a base shard of pottery, much bigger than a lot of the stuff we were finding and got my instructor really exciting, just looking at the technique of um, how it was instructed. He literally looked at the piece and told me about 25 different things, start to finish, what it was made from, how it was cooked, how it was prepped, how it was painted, everything just by looking at it. And I was floored. <clears throat> But um, that piece I found through a process of floating, <coughs> which is really fun and exciting. Essentially, um, from the day previously, when you get to the bottom, wherever you're ending that day, as far as uh, digging, they take a bunch of soil samples, put them up in bags, bring them over to the um, post-ex lab. And then essentially, you take handfuls of soil, you put it in a bucket, and you swirl your hand around. Um, anything that's natural um, will float to the top. And we use this uh, really thin mesh sif, and it'll catch everything. We can send that off to a lab. They can identify it for pollens, for grains, um, pieces of fabric, literally anything that could tell us about the diet, the lifestyle, trade, anything like that that's natural. And then everything that's left at the bottom of the bucket is uh, dirt and rocks, pottery bones, and you just scoop it up with your hands and look through it, and you find pieces left and right. Um, so that's a really nice... Thing to do kind of off-site but super duper important um, and essentially at the end of the day you know you look at this tray of finds and you're like wow this is really cool like we found all this stuff out of the ground but it's really helping paint the larger photo of what's happening who's involved how are these people living um, and it really gives us the key that a lot of historical documents um, just don't give us and that's why we kind of relay a lot on archaeology. So unfortunately, I was only there for two weeks. Um, the program at large was a full four weeks. So I have um, a bunch of friends who are there um, currently digging. Um, they found a bit more than when I was there as far as linking it to the medieval town. And I've been getting updates constantly. Um, and they're making really good progress. And at this point, we found enough that we can prove that this village did in fact exist, which is huge um, for everyone involved. So. Here are just a couple more fun photos from Ireland. Um, it was a really great time and the archeology span there is just a lot more rich than what you can find here in the US, mainly because the timeline is so much bigger. Um, so many different cultures are interacting with one another and you can literally stumble on the ground and find a piece of pottery, it's everywhere. So yeah, any questions? That's really amazing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that you had to come back to Ohio. <laughs> but um, do you, I, I have a question just in general about the program. So this was four weeks. It goes, the total one goes for four weeks. Is this mm -hmm. something that they'll do multiple times throughout the year? As you said that the, the uh, farmer is giving them a year. Right. Yeah, so the field school has about, I want to say five or six programs running 
um, from like spring to summer and they have a couple in the winter. Um, so they have a home location and I think it's outside of Dublin, but they have different areas that they work with. Um, so at this specific site at the Heritage Park, they had one last month and one this month. And I think they only have two or three at that location, but they're constantly having different programs going. I don't think there's one following us. So whatever they finish up um, with the kids who are still there, that's all the time that they will have. We're at like the end of that year contract. So if they're able to find enough, they could potentially extend it. But for the most part, we are the last ones that are going to be able to do this. Uh, Patty asked, uh, what got you into this career, uh, into, into archaeology? Um, it kind of happened by chance. My freshman year, um, the classes that I was able to take, the school essentially chose for me, and I got put into Archaeology 101, and I was like, sure, this will be fun, and I ended up really, really liking it. I had a wonderful professor, um, and she was like, if you're interested in minoring it, I really think you should, so I went ahead and made it as a minor. Um, and unfortunately the program no longer exists at the school. So in order to complete it, they essentially told me like, hey, you're gonna have to find a field school. So um, they recommended I check this one out and I'm really happy I did. So it kind of all just happened by chance, um, but it ended up working out really well because I never thought I'd have an opportunity like this. So it was, it was really nice. Is this field school not specifically connected uh, with Wittenberg then as a partner? No. It's, they're very much their own entity, but we've had, I think, 15 to 20 students that have been in our archaeology program go to them. So we have a really great relationship, but they are their own um, entity in Ireland. What a great experience. Uh, excited for you, you got to do that. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Gabrielle? Well, I thought if, um, I say if you want to um, stop sharing your screen, we can just go to um, so we can maybe see each other and uh, see if anybody has anything else. Um, Ray, I thought maybe you could tell people a little bit about. Um, what your next uh, steps are uh, after the Heritage Center and how it relates to uh, the field and what you'll be studying. Um, so yes, uh, next week is my last week with um, the Heritage Center. I am moving to Washington, DC. I have been accepted into a PhD program um, at George Mason into the history department. I will be working with, um, I will be working underneath a woman named Dr. Gabrielle Tyak. She's the curator for the um, Native Amer the American Indian Smithsonian. Um, and I will be uh, focusing my dissertation work on um, decolonizing museum spaces, um, on, and just in general, making sure that museum collections are more accessible to their um, cultures. The way I see a museum um, and the way I've been taught to see museums is that we are temporary spaces, even if we own those specific objects. Um, I've always been a strong proponent for if a culture, specifically just with my background, if a native culture wants their stuff back, we should give it back if they feel that they have since developed the means to care for it properly, um, they should be allowed to care for it properly um, and tell the story that, that their culture wants told, wants to, be, wants to be told and not necessarily the story that we feel as interpreters should be told. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, I'll definitely miss Clark County and everyone here, but, um, I've always wanted to work for the Smithsonian since I was a kid, so I'm, I'm buzzing. <laughs> well, we'll we'll definitely miss you too, um, but I'm very excited for you. I mean, the Smithsonian really is the museum nerd's dream uh, to end up there. 
Uh, I mean, if you can't be Indiana Jones, which is what, you know, I wanted to be, or, you know, dig for dinosaurs, which is also what I wanted to do. Uh, but I never ended up going into archaeology. So both of you guys have had experiences that, that you know, I've never had. So it's, um, it's uh, Rachel, it's been, it's been great to have your um, additional experience that you, you know, as a, with, with the collections that we have. Um, because you you have a bit more of a background on the stuff for you to be able to, um, to help more with identification and information and things like that. And I know that um, us moving forward, we're hoping to do more partnering with and using resources that are available to us from um, Native American populations, um, like uh, people like Talon Silverhorn that were hired to work with the state of Ohio and uh, and with the um, new Shawnee uh, State Park that they're they're working on over in Greene County that he'll, you know, people like him um, will be available to us to help us do um, better and different programming that is more um, real to the, you know, the Native American experience than the lens that maybe we've been coming at it for as far as our interpretation in the past. So, um, well, hopefully, maybe you'll be the person we can consult with too as you as you move forward in your program um, to get your PhD. Um, you'll or at least you'll you'll help us with connections, especially if you'll be um, working under somebody with the, in the Native American um, Smithsonian Museum, which that's a newer museum, isn't it? Uh, it's one of their newest ones. It started in New York, and they moved it to. Um, the Capitol a few years ago. Well, um, that'll be an awesome experience to be in DC and, and uh, doing all of that. Um, so I wanted to I um, let people know about some like local uh, possibilities that are here for you to um, learn more about archaeology or things that are going on. I know that um, if you've been watching on Columbia Street, um, uh, I'll, where the uh, Dement or Columbia Cemetery is, you'll see that there's a lot that's been going on um, over the last several months that's very visible, but that's part of a project that's, that's been going on for a number of years um, in partnership, um, starting out in partnership with Wittenberg. Um, uh, Dar Brooks Hedstrom had always had a class um, over there. I can't remember, I don't know, Gabrielle, if you know, uh, any more detail about when she started that, but she's no longer at Wittenberg. Um, but that was something that when they were excavating over at the cemetery, um, that was a project that they had started to kind of see what they could find there as far as um, what was, um, you know, just under the soil at different parts. And um, they allowed the public to come over and kind of see a little bit of what they're doing. And I know um, we're hoping to have maybe a, a possible upcoming virtual program where we can have people that are working on that current project, like um, Chris Hazel, um, his, his group that is um, working with the excavation. And I know that Kevin Rose with the Turner Foundation has talked about getting us as a staff over there. Um, Rachel, I said we'd try and do it before you leave, maybe. So maybe we can get over there in the next week or so if the weather's okay to see um, uh, a little bit about what's been going on over there. But that's something that we hope maybe we can share with you virtually. I know that they'll be doing a lot of stuff in the community to share about that project. Um, Tom Loftus has been out talking to groups and other people that are involved with that. So that's something that um, if you're more interested in something that's going on locally right now, um, they'll be sharing more about that. Um, cemetery restoration project that they're doing over there um, that will involve a, a new wall, re replacing some of the headstones that had fallen, um, and uh, they're putting the uh, walkway back in. But um, I know we, we talked about that we, you know, we could have those people kind of present a little bit more about what they've been doing. Um, and uh, Bob Holsizer, um, and his wife Flossie, you know, is one of our volunteers too. They, um, he's been involved with that project as well. Um, so I'm sure he can tell more, be another person that can tell about that in the future. But there's a lot going on in the area. I know um, Gabrielle, they were um, doing something over at, uh, on campus a couple of years ago as part of one of the archaeology uh, classes. So there's always something going on locally in, in relation with Wittenberg. Um, 
you know, just in general, uh, you have a national park about an hour from you uh, that's going to be a World Heritage Site here in the next year or so. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, always also something cool to check out. This, that's the, the serpent. Uh, so it's Hopewell or Culture. Hopewell. Uh, it's Mound City, and then they're including Serpent's Mound, um, I think maybe Sunwatch, Fort Ancient, and um, the other location site that are connected to Mound City. And then Sunwatch is a location very close to us, um, one of the Boonshoff's um, uh, sites that they oversee. And um, they've been a great resource for us as far as um, uh, being there for questions and stuff because that um, that's more of their expertise and and that would you know when we have questions about our own collections and and things like that so um, so yeah well thank you guys uh, for sharing tonight and Rachel thank you for all you've done and um, well we'll we'll definitely miss you um, she's our, our registrar so she's been dealing with a lot all the incoming um, new stuff and and working heavily on our uh, re-inventory project um, and going through a lot of the rooms um, in the collections area. So uh, I don't think we have anything on tap, like scheduled for our, our next virtual programs, but we'll keep people posted um, if we do anything again later in August or um, we'll definitely have something in September. This may be our August one, even though it's very early, but um, we'll, we'll make sure we, we've got some ideas, but we don't have any dates set. So we'll make sure that we let people know what any um, upcoming things are. So, um, do you guys have anything else that you wanna say or share um, before we go? Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you everybody for stopping in. Well, thank you guys, everybody. Have a good night and we'll we'll see you next time. Bye.